Okay, so hello everyone, um, both in person and online people joining us today. Um, my name's Brinny. Um, if you don't know me, I use she, her pronouns. And today I'm going to be running a session just introducing you to the basics of arguments, um, thinking them up, writing them, making them important, basically the foundations of good debating and what you should be bearing in mind if any of you are trialling for Easter's or chairman's on the weekend. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is obviously come up with arguments. So if any of you debated last week, you'll be familiar with this. Um, you want to start prep time by brainstorming everything you can think of. Don't stress if your arguments are not amazing. Just try and get something written down. Um, and before you get into arguments, please make sure you're clear on the broad meaning of the topic and what side you're doing. It may sound really simple, but I did a topic at a mini recently um, where there was like a triple negative in the topic. Um, it was really confusing and my team spent like 10 minutes trying to work out what we were arguing as the negative team. Um, would not recommend. Um, now, if you're stuck and you're just like, what is this topic? I don't know what this means. Um, or, you know, you just don't know what to run. Just like think about questions like, who's this going to affect? What impact is it going to have on them? Um, what groups or people will have strong opinions on this? Do we, for example, have a moral obligation towards a certain group? And also, can you recycle any arguments from a similar topic that you've done? Um, so topics about banning certain things often say, you know, individuals should be able to do what they want. Um, and that's stuff like, you know, topics about consent to bodily harm, topics about um, alcoholism, drugs, anything like that that often talks about individual choice and also the role of government to protect people. So once you do a few of these debates, you're definitely going to be able to start recycling arguments. Okay, but how do I know if my argument is good? Because you want to like think of good arguments. You don't just want to like, you know, run the first thing you think of because often the first thing you think of is not necessarily the most intuitive or good case to run. So You've done your first five minutes of prep time, either discussing with your team or prepping silently. Different pros have different ways of doing this. Um, anyway, now you need to consider which are going to be the most persuasive. Um, so a few things to consider here. Firstly, and I think this is probably the most important, can I prove that this will actually happen? Because if you say something like, um, teaching STEM in schools um, is going to solve climate change. Like, sure, if we have more scientists, they can probably do cool things with technology to stop climate change. But there are an incredible amount of steps you need to prove, right? You need to prove that teaching STEM actually leads people into becoming scientists. You need to prove that there's actually a solution to climate change that people can viably come up with in time. This argument in an eight minute speech is just going to be way too unwieldy. Therefore, don't go too extreme. The other thing you can think about, does this policy address the root cause of the issue? Or are there other things contributing to the issue? So your policy probably isn't going to make um, that big a difference. Um, the other thing is like, how many people or stakeholders does this argument impact? And this goes into making your arguments important. Um, so this looks like thing. Another way you can like make this important is talking about like how big, deep, severe is the harm or benefit. Like there may be only a small minority of people um, who are harmed by a policy, but if those people are going to be so harmed that their mental health is going to be destroyed or, you know, they'll literally be risking their lives, this is still an impact that you can bring to the debate. Um, because you've had such a hard impact on some people, whereas the impact on the majority of people may actually be much less. Other things to think about, how will this work out in the short term versus the long term? Some policies might look great in the short term, but they don't provide a long term solution to a problem. So that's another good thing to think about. And finally, another really important one, does it directly clash with the opposition team's likely case? Because if so, your rebuttals will be better and you'll be able to integrate your rebuttals. So instead of just saying your rebuttals at the start of your speech, you're going to be able to tie in your rebuttals to your first, second or third argument, which is just going to make your speech flow a lot better and just make it a lot easier for you to impact your points, I guess. Um, so 
for example, going back to my example about banning debates, if you run a point about individual choice to say we should not ban a particular thing, that is going to directly clash um, with the opposition's case about it is the role of the government to regulate individuals' choices and stop them from making bad choices. You can see how those arguments are basically two sides of the same coin. Okay, common issues to avoid, and some of this is based on what I saw in the debate that I adjudicated last week. So trying to prove high impacts with low impact policies. The STEM example I used before is probably a really good example of this, but another one is like, more media diversity will solve racism. Obviously not, right? Like neither team in any debate is gonna be able to solve the issue of racism. That is just like way too big an impact. But more media diversity might make people more open-minded. It might have a good impact in terms of empowering a particular minority group um, to think that they can do things or enter certain spaces. Another thing, relying on a specific or extreme example where a particular policy or actor turned out to be bad or good. Um, I can't think of an example right now, um, but... If your case is basically reliant on one example, for example, I remember I did a debate about whether we should oppose feminist icons. And I talked about Jermaine Greer, who is an Australian feminist, who's recently said some things which are quite transphobic. Um, and obviously that's an example of a feminist icon being incredibly bad because she has all this media airtime to say these transphobic things. However, not all feminist icons are transphobic, and I was not able to prove the impact because the debate was about feminist icons generally. Jermaine Greer bad does not mean feminist icons bad, is basically what I'm saying here. Another thing, relying on things which are intuitively good or bad. For example, I think most people here would say, we live in a democracy, so democracy must be cool, right? Your ad is a lot more objective than this. Um, so you need to prove to your ad why something is going to be specifically good or important, even if it seems obvious, even if you're just like, of course individuals should be able to make choices for themselves. Of course this particular group being ostracized is bad. You always need to tell the ad why, because your ad will approach the debate from the most objective perspective possible. Um, your ad is just cold, calculating, analytical, um, tell them why they should care, basically. Um, relying on a very niche or minority stakeholder, um, you know, this will have a terrible impact. Um, I don't know, like if it was a debate about cosmetic surgery, um, if you could talk about like, this will have a terrible impact on people who want to change their bodies to look particularly weird and that's their way of self-expression. Obviously, this is a very small minority of people. They're not the main point of this debate, even if there is an impact on them. Finally, um, assuming that a particular policy is automatically good or bad for a certain group without saying what the harms and benefits are. Um, yeah, please come in. Just running a session about arguments. Um, so, um, this looks like saying things like, well, of course more media diversity is good for people of color. Like, yes, it probably is, but you need to tell us why. Okay, so um, we've got a topic up here. This is gonna be a bit different because we're in a lecture theater and I know that some of you are online. Um, so, um, the topic up the top is this house would force elected politicians and their families to use only public health and education services. If you haven't been around debating much before, this house would is basically, you know, we support this. Um, so we'll split into an AF and NEG group. Um, just looking at the audience, I think um, you guys can go NEG, you guys can go AF. So you are supporting this policy. You are against this policy. Um, Anyway, so we're going to take about, I'm just looking at the time, yep, three minutes is probably good, and I want you to think about the most important points, which stakeholders are affected on your side, what are going to be your most important harms and benefits. So don't worry if you don't come up with too many points, this isn't a full brainstorm, um, it's basically just like seeing if you can think up any points. Uh, we might not take the full three minutes. Okay. Okay, so in the interests of time, um, just finish what you're saying and I'm just going to bring it back to the main group. 
Um, so, first of all, would someone on the affirmative team uh, want to tell me what their one or two most important arguments were? Um, we spoke about credibility and um, if politicians are using public services, um, I guess it could strengthen the public view on public services and like, I guess it could um, make people more inclined to use public services instead of private their trusting system. Yeah, okay, so I'm not sure how well people can hear that, um, but someone's just talked about credibility and increasing trust in public services. Um, so, and you know, inclining people to use them more than private services. I think that's a really good point. Um, again, you'd have to say like why it's important, but yeah, great start. Um, someone from negative. Um, just like tell me one of your important arguments. Don't worry about rebuttals at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, group Neg just brought up superficial engagement with public policy. So yeah, like there's a lot of examples, like I can think of like Boris Johnson, for example, praising the National Health Service in the UK and then actually like defunding it and not actually caring about it. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a superficial level of engagement and could be seen as performative. Um, someone from Affirmative want to give me another argument? Again, no stress about rebuttals. Yeah, definitely. So Group F has just hit on what I think is probably the most important point in this debate, which is making sure that public services are efficient by incentivizing politicians to invest in them because they are the ones using these services. Um, someone from Negative want to bring me a final point? Yeah, I think freedom to choose is an important one. I think this probably especially applies in countries where there are religious hospitals and schools and there are politicians from certain religious groups. I think you can definitely bring in that there. Um, for reference, I think the neg side in this debate is slightly harder to argue, but you do get unbalanced motions sometimes. And um, yeah, it would just be about explaining why that specifically is more important and then trying to mitigate some of Affirmative's material about why this improves public services like maybe it only improves public services in certain areas where elected politicians live um, and some areas are still left behind I don't know like there's lots of ways to argue this but great brainstorm guys okay so now moving on to writing your argument now important disclaimer before I get into this um, Obviously, different debaters have different styles. We've got a lot of people presenting sessions tonight, and I think they all kind of altered this bit to suit what they like to do. This is what I like to rely on. I find it's quite an intuitive structure, but if you find something that works better for you, or you know, you get a pro who does something different, um, obviously don't disregard what they say in favor of this. So firstly, and I think this is important, just like short statement of your argument. So why this incentivizes politicians to improve healthcare and education. Um, this is important, especially at the start of your speech, when you say, you know, three main points in my speech today. Firstly, why this incentivizes, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just way easier for your adjudicator to follow when you have a short statement of your argument. It can be a question, um, it can be a few words. People like to phrase them in different ways, but please have titles for your arguments. It gets very confusing otherwise. Secondly, what does this look like? Examples can be helpful. Now, I already warned you against arguing by example. Um, for example, in my failure to prove the impact of Jermaine Greer in the feminism debate. But obviously, like in a lot of scenarios, um, you do need to define um, 
what a particular policy is going to look like. It's not the same as defining the topic like you do at the start of a high school debate, but you know, um, I think you could say, um, for example, if, and I think this motion was used last week, uh, this, house, this house would um, ban drugs. Um, if, you, if you were the negative team and you were talking about how this actually makes drugs more dangerous, you could be like, this looks like people not wanting to go to hospital when they've overdosed. This looks like addicts being stigmatized and being more unwilling to seek help because they are seen as criminals. Just stuff along these lines, just so your adjudicator knows where you're going with something um, and just has a clear picture of it. Because if you're just like, this makes drugs more dangerous, I'm kind of just like, why? How does it make drugs more dangerous? Give me more information. Um, okay, thirdly, and this is super important, why is this true or likely? So I think a very common piece of feedback you will get in your first debates is an adjudicator being like, yeah, you know, you told me that the feminist movement wants to get more women on board with it, but you didn't really tell me why it was true. Why, why was it so important for them to get more women on board with their movement? Why was this more important than catering to minority women, for example? Um, I'm just using examples from a whole range of different topics to reflect the diversity of topics that we do at MAD. Um, so you need to explain why is this true or, you know, why is this likely to happen? What, what is it about forcing politicians to use these services that makes politicians, you know, likely to um, Im improve them? Like, is it because, you know, when they see the worst of it, it shocks them into doing it? Uh, is it, you know, just because they want nice things for their families? Um, is it because it allows them to interact with professionals in these areas, teachers, healthcare providers, and this means that they can cater better to the people on the ground because they're talking to them about their needs? All of these can be valid reasons about why that argument's true, but you really need to step it out for your adjudicator because your adjudicator is not going to fill in the blanks for you. Fourthly, why is this important and why should we care about this? I'm not doing a session on weighing. If any of you know what that is, I'm not sure how experienced um, a debater everyone in this room and online is. Um, but this definitely comes into weighing. Um, and I think it's good to be comparative on this. Why is this important point? Um, and what I mean by being comparative is, you know, why is our point about individual choice more important than the other team's point? about the role of government to regulate people's choices. You know, and this comes back to what I was saying before. Is it because the harm is greater on their side? Is it because our policy impacts more people and benefits more people, even if this benefit is shallower? Um, is it because we owe a moral obligation to this certain group and therefore it's more important? I don't know, but you need to tell the adjudicator why they should care. I know I've said a lot about this in this presentation, but I really cannot stress this enough because you definitely get this as feedback at high quality tournaments. The ad will be like, but you never explained why X actor was so important. Okay, and finally, and this is also known as impacting what is the outcome or end point of this argument? So, for example, you could say, at the end of this argument, you have more women on board with the feminist movement, you have more women campaigning for feminist causes, you have more women empowered to speak up for themselves in the workplace, whatever, um, but you need to explain to me what your argumentation is actually leading to, what is the impact? Because you can give me lots of reasons why a particular policy is great or why a particular actor should do things, but unless you tell me what the end point of this argument is, what the outcome is, I guess it just finishes off your argument um, and tells me you know, why I should back it as an adjudicator. Okay, so using the example of why this incentivizes politicians to improve healthcare and education, which I think the affirmative team uh, slash group very correctly came up with, um, go through the four steps, I've sort of given you the title on the previous slide, and try to come up with an argument. I'm happy for you to do this in small groups, pairs, whatever, please make sure that everyone has someone to talk to. Um, anyway, so I want you to go through what does this look like? Why is this true? 
why is this important and what is the outcome i guess i've given you some clues but i'm sure that you can like structure it um better than i did in my sort of rough presentation um okay so i'm hoping everyone's clear on what we're doing obviously like shout out if you have any questions um i'll give you the next three minutes maybe then we'll share back and then i'll do questions at the end if we have time just like bring your discussions to an end if you can don't worry if you didn't finish it takes a while to come up with a good argument um hope you haven't been too distracted by the arrival of pizza i know it's very exciting okay so um first of all maybe someone from this side of the room um could you just tell us a bit about like how how you went through maybe like the first couple of steps with this argument what were your thoughts yeah Yeah, no, that's really great. Um, I, I think that for, for like a sort of three or four minute discussion, whatever I gave you, that was really good. Um, so to recap, um, basically, um, we were just talking about um, when politicians are forced to use these services, this obviously means, you know, their children end up in public schools, for example, um, which means they're just incentivized to improve the quality um, and put more money into it. Um, and I guess this is important because it leads to flow on benefits for the rest of society, because all of these services are improved for everyone. That was like what you were getting at, right? Like I'm paraphrasing for the sake of this recording, but yeah. Awesome. Um, did anyone sort of have anything different on this side of the room? And it doesn't matter if it's only slightly different. I'm just interested to hear ideas. Yeah. Yeah, and I really like that numbers weighting, i.e. 100 politicians having to make probably small sacrifices in their personal lives, right? Like going to a public hospital in this country doesn't mean you're going to die. Um, so versus, you know, um, a million Australians having access to better services. I think that's a really good way to put it in terms of a numbers game. And also like the principle over the practical, like sure, maybe we care about individual choice usually, but do we care about the principle of individual choice more than we care about, you know, everyday people's lives and access to public services. Um, I think that's a really clever way of waiting it. So yeah, great. Okay, um, so we're wrapping up this session now, but yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm gonna do kind of a Q&A thing, I guess. Um, so, um, like, yeah, does anyone have any questions on arguments or anything debate related, really? Yes. Okay, so um, Jasmine's just asked me, um, it is Jasmine, right? Yeah. Yes, cool. Um, Jasmine's just asked me, um, basically, um, should you try to integrate rebuttal if it clashes directly with the other team's case? Does that mean you can't do rebuttal at the start? Um, totally up to you. Um, 
at this point in my debating, I like to try to integrate rebuttal where I can, unless I just have a couple of points of rebuttal which don't intuitively fit anywhere, in which case I'll just chuck them at the start. However, I know that novices can find this confusing, and I know that if you try and include rebuttal in an argument that already has five steps, that can be quite confusing for you. Um, as a novice, you're not going to like give bad speeches just because you're doing rebuttals at the start. As long as you clearly explain your rebuttals and they're not just like one-liners, well, you know, we think X thing is more important and then you move on. As long as your rebuttals are well explained, I don't think it matters too much where they go in your speech and probably don't stress too much about that. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Beautiful. Um, I'm a novice debater, debated only once last week, and I was just wondering how many arguments each person is meant to make out of the six people. Um, like, it's totally up to you. Um, personally, I wouldn't have more than like four main points in a speech. I think especially as a novice, it's incredibly hard to prove the importance of an argument um, when you spend less than two minutes on it and you inevitably spend less than two minutes on it um, when you've got like five main points. Um, as a novice, I think it's also probably might be more important to zoom in on two or three. I do two or three arguments well before I do four badly because I think one or two of those arguments are likely to become debate winning, whereas if you've got four arguments, you know, one of them's either just not going to be well impacted enough, you're not going to explain why it's important well enough, and it's just not going to win you the debate. The other thing to bear in mind, though, is that if you feel like you haven't fleshed out an argument enough at first speaker, um, then you are totally able to... Um, you know, get your second speaker to build on it. I think this is quite different from what you normally do in high school debating. Please get your second speaker to build it up. Please get your second speaker to spend more time explaining why it's important. Because a lot of the time, because, you know, especially first affirmative, you've got to have a model, you've got to set up the whole debate. You might not spend enough time proving this. Your second speaker really comes in handy here. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, it does partly. So you have your first and second doing about three to four points each, ideally. Then your third will do uh, make no new points and just have rebuttals and conclusions. Um. Yeah. So I think I probably need to be clearer. I I'd aim for about. I wouldn't aim for four points. I'd aim for three at first and second as a very rough guideline bearing in mind that every debate is different. And third speaker, third speaker, I like to separate the debate into main clashes, but you're absolutely right. Don't bring new arguments at third speaker. You can't do that. Um, yeah, so basically at third, um, you want to separate the debate into sort of three main clashes, sometimes two, and just explain how your arguments clashed with the other team and why your material and arguments are specifically more important. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, great. Glad I could help. Um, yeah, just in like, can I keep going with this? Yes. Are we wrapping this up? Cool. Any more questions about debating? Yes. Could you explain a bit more about what you mean by the nature of humanity, just so I'm clear? There's a lot of times that in a debate, someone will be like, um, it is the nature of, like, it is human nature to um, be selfish. It is human yep. nature to do X, Y. Yeah. And it's all, it always gets a bit easy. Yeah. It's difficult to justify fully, even if it's sort of innate. So I was wondering how you would justify why you can force that in the first place. I would usually like obviously this is a big point which I would probably have to spend some time thinking about. I'd probably
probably steer away from making broad generalizations about human nature, because if you can bring up a few examples about how humans are selfish, your opposition can almost certainly bring up examples about, you know, where humans are kind. However, I think what you were saying was probably a bit more interesting than that, which is like, why politicians or why humans in certain situations become selfish. And I think this is where you get to talk about incentives. So why are politicians incentivized to be selfish? Um, I think, you know, you can talk about the toxic um, culture in a lot of parliaments, you know, I think with recent revelations in the media, it's been revealed as a very sort of toxic macho culture. I think you can talk about people being power hungry. I think you can talk about the kind of people who survive in politics are likely to be people from privileged backgrounds, um, who are motivated by monetary gain. Um, yeah, so I guess just talking about like the incentives available to people, you know, does a politician, for example, know that they will get votes anyway, because they're able to enact sort of populist policies without making any real change, therefore they're not incentivized to help people, just stuff like that. So just think about, I guess, what motivates an actor? What drives them? What do they really want? Does that make sense? Thank you.